morning and thank you all for joining us. We are truly honored to have with us today just one of my favorite collections of people in the whole entire world. We have Professor Emerita Vernalia Randall, Vernalia Randall with the University of Dayton School of Law, Professor Jelani Jefferson Exum from Detroit Mercy School of Law, Dan Davis Emeritus from University of Toledo School of Law, and Jeff Portnoy, like me, just, just another lawyer, First Amendment expert, also a color commentator for University of Hawaii basketball and other things. So we will try and make this as rewarding, as in entertaining, as enlightening as we can. And where we'd like to start is, Fernelia, you have a report coming out that updates one from 17 years ago. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, thank you. Uh, 17 years ago, I did a report called The Whitest Law School. Uh, 2004, the Whitest Law School report where I ranked uh, all the law schools, 181 law schools, by how white they were. Uh, and I have updated that the, I'm 2021 report coming out uh, next week on the internet, uh, the whitest law school. Schools are less white, but they're still more white than the LSAT application pools. Uh, so that to me, that means they are still, uh, there's still a lot of whiteness that needs to be addressed in, in most of the schools. So uh, if you go to racism.org after next week, it will be right there up in the menu, uh, 2021 Whitest Law School Report. So dare we ask who's at the bottom of the list at number one? Georgia. What a shock. <laughs> well, it, it, my technique is not just percentage, but what I call excess whiteness. I look at how much whiteness they had uh, compared to the application pool for national, state, and regional, which then meant that uh, schools that were in relatively white, communities weren't penalized as much, although some of them end up not as white as they should be, uh, as schools that were in communities that had a lot of diversity but weren't meeting the needs of that. Uh, Hawaii was down in uh, um, uh, low, which you could expect, uh, although I think Hawaii uh, was one, of the nine schools that whiteness increased uh, over the 17 years, even though it was a small amount of whiteness, uh, it did increase. Anyway. So would it be fair to say- I that... don't want to take up- <laughs> No, no, no. I... Okay, but go ahead. It, it goes to good places. So would it be fair to say that Georgia excelled in achieving disproportionate whiteness? And if so, how did they manage that? Yeah, if you could look at, we're number one. <laughs> <laughs> if they want to claim number one in whiteness, uh, I, the, the whole problem is the admission process mm -hmm. where schools decide that they want to target to admit a certain group of people, a certain LSAT score, and then they don't even look at others who could do law school and be good lawyers because they don't have the LSAT score. There's a place for the LSAT, but I think that place is not in the admission process, but in the planning of the educational process. The law, law schools use cutoffs and, uh, and say, you know, a person who has an LSAT below this amount doesn't qualify. I didn't get, most of the law schools that I went to did not admit me because I had 
a below average LSAT. And and uh, and so that's that's how they achieve that. Uh, that combined with whatever overt racism and uh, implicit racism they have and when they evaluate the application. So let me ask a little bit more pointed question. And that is, is the ability of applicants, if admitted, to service underserved communities and constituencies taken into account? Does it have any weight at all? I mean, other people can talk to this. I don't think it's taken into account. I have not been in the admissions process for 12 years, so maybe it is now, but I can tell you it's nowhere near like medical schools are. Medical schools for decades have been admitting based on, because they, they know that people go back to communities like the ones they came from. And that if they wanted to get doctors into com communities of color, the only way to do that is to educate doctors from those communities. And, uh, and so medicine has done a better job. I'm not saying it to, that they couldn't improve, but they've done a much better job than laws. Jo law is still, I think, one of the least diverse professions in the United States. Yeah. Anybody else want to speak up to that? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll jump in here. I mean, one of the reasons why um, law schools operate that way is because there's such a focus on rankings and, you know, it could go on and on about that and how relevant or irrelevant they are. But um, when it comes down to rankings, everybody's looking at the different metrics that move you up in rankings or that can tank you in rankings. And so bar passage ends up being one of those and statistics talk about, you know, your LSAT score combined with your first year grades, having some indication about ultimate bar passage. Now, you know, what it doesn't do is look at individual circumstances, nor does it look at what schools can do to actually help to promote bar success along the way. So it's like the low hanging fruit for schools, you know, like let's just stick with a certain LSAT, um, it helps with bar passage, generally speaking, but also just the LSAT, the um, uh, sort of admissions criteria of your school plays into your rankings also. So everybody's, you know, caught up in this rankings game um, and, it ends up being a huge driving factor, regardless of what we all know about, you know, how if you sort of take an interest in individual student success and build programs that can address student needs, that students can be successful um, yeah. across a broad range of indicators, entering indicators. But, you know, that takes a little more uh, resources and focus and energy to do so. When I was at Dayton, when I was at Dayton, I advocated for students who had LSATs into the 30s, 130s, which people say those students can't do law school, but they can if you, you, you know, it's just a matter of what you were saying, giving them the support. And one of the things that you do bar passage, we, Dayton's bar passage was not tied to race. And so even though um, many of the minorities had much lower LSATs. The, the program we gave them meant that when they got to the end, their bar passing was not related to their LSAT score, uh, uh, unlike uh, the other students. So, anyway, oh, I, so I used to read you. I used to read U.S. News and World Report in the '60s. Okay, when. <laughs> Read Time and Newsweek and all that. And I was turned off to US News and World Report because of the way that they wrote about the civil rights movement at the time about Martin Luther King. It was very, very sort of uh, anti-progressive. So when I came into teaching in 45 and I saw everybody talking about US News and World Report rankings, I was like, them? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> really? I mean, you know, and I, I do know that I was in some meetings along the way where there was the idea of adding some kind of diversity aspect to what they were doing, but they always kept it separate, right? You know, so it's, it wasn't integrated into the actual ranking thing. So, you know, it, but I have a private entity have such influence in the minds of people uh, was I always found really bizarre, particularly where it came from, you know, but that's just me, you know, I just, that, that bothered me. I, I wanted to, to speak about something, if I can, 
which is all the heat that Cuomo is getting right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's three aspects I can see. One is the nursing home limited liability thing. The second thing is sort of hiding his numbers. And the third thing is the sexual harassment that not really, I mean, amazingly stupid for a governor to be doing that. Okay. But <laughs> let me speak to the limited liability thing. You know, what I've been struck by is that his thing was sort of an executive order, I think, focused on nursing homes, right? There are at least 15 or 16 states that passed legislation that, to limit liability for businesses due to COVID, you know? So I'm like, excuse me, this is kind of like, you know, I don't know, complaining about your nose for your head or something like that. I mean, that that part of it makes no sense to me that people can sit here and all shocked at the nursing home where even like oh, they passed a law basically saying you can't sue or you can't do anything for any business, you know, based on COVID. The problem with Andrew Cuomo is he just became too big for his britches. Mm -hmm. And you, when you become too big for your britches, all of your enemies decide to come out of the woodwork. He has had a very disparate kind of popularity rating, yeah. very high with the public. But he's got a lot of enemies internally in New York State, including the mayor, who has been brutal the last couple of days in his criticisms. And I know people in New York City, and that's just animosity that's just been waiting and waiting to bubble over. So. I think he's in trouble. I think he made most of this on his own by becoming too much of a public figure. And uh, he's going to have a lot of trouble trying to get out of it, particularly with, as you know, the New York Attorney General yeah. deciding that she's going to investigate what started out to be uh, what I think a very serious, legitimate issue on reporting and whether they're right. being withheld and now is turned in sexual harassment, which just becomes a he said, she said. So we'll see how that all works out. Yeah. He obviously apologize. forgot. He forgot the CALP principle, keep a low profile. Well, he couldn't keep a low profile because he's an overt bully. <laughs> and he has been for years. And so he, you know, the rest of the nation may look at him and say, see this person who comes out and do slideshows. But he, he has not, he's been a pretty big bully. Uh, and it's, it's the sexual, the problem with the sexual harassment thing is that he, it ain't something that is surprising. Oh, you know, exactly. it's not, you know, and, and it's workplace, so some of it. And so it's not just sexual harassment, it's sexual harassment in the workplace. And and it wouldn't be it wouldn't matter if he was a man a low level manager doing what it. I, what, what I find curious, and I again, who knows the facts? What's curious is that none of the sexual harassment became public until all of the attacks started on the uh, mislabeling of these COVID deaths. Most of this allegedly occurred in 2018, 2019, and none of it was uh, made public until a week ago. So, you know, there is this kind of piling on mentality, which unfortunately we see throughout the, the country, and, you know, and, and uh, it's hard. And I'm not suggesting, by the way, that these things didn't occur or that he's not a bully or, and, uh, you know, and that he shouldn't, you know, like many other politicians find themselves above the law when it comes to things like workplace harassment. But the timing is curious. I think it, it gets tricky with sexual harassment because, you know, when you're in a workplace environment and things happen, um, you sort of fight an uphill battle as the, as the you know, person who's making the allegations um, because you're fighting against a power structure, you know, so you, so you, you know, you have every um, incentive to just be quiet. So then what happens is when somebody's under investigation for something else or they're vulnerable, um, what ends up happening is somebody who sort of knows that the stories are there, but they got shut down, tells you now is the time where someone will listen to you. Um, and mm -hmm. so it, it makes it look as though, you know, you're sort of just 
picking this time to pile on to someone. And there's some of that from the person who got in your ear to say, now's the time. Um, but it doesn't make the allegations less legitimate. And unfortunately, it's just the reality of the fact that the run of the mill, you know, day to day, your story's not heard. And you know it's going to get shut down and you know you're going to be ostracized and you so you sit on it until there's an opportune time um but it you know it undercuts you know people end up questioning it in this sort of way but you know so i look at it through that lens that it, i'm telling you know, stories from 20 and 30 years ago that mm -hmm. i didn't tell mm -hmm. i'm posting stuff on you know uh just because 20 and 30 years ago i had no power and i had and and once you sit on it sit sit on it a while you sort of forget it and you try to move on and then like you say when that when people come back up in the news for some reason then you remember the story of what they did to you and you sort of want to say wait a minute <laughs> this this is no shining armor person 10 years 15 years 20 years ago she or he did this to me and um and, and so that's part of it it is sort of a, the I, I think you're exactly right that when person people of fear put themselves out in front they invite the people who have stories about them to come out eventually let me change the topic though to what i think is the most critical now and that's the attack on the voting rights all around the country and House Bill number one, which passed yesterday, but is not going to get through the Senate unless they can overcome the filibuster. The Supreme Court getting ready to rule on a voting rights case and according to most commentators looks clearly to be six to three in favor of Arizona and limiting voting rights 16 states in various stages of limiting the ability to go to the polls. This is a story, this is part of the problem I have with this Cuomo thing, which is just occupying the news cycle when it's infinitesimally unimportant when you're looking at what really is important this week and next week, and that's the ability of people to go to the polls. Yeah. And is there gonna be some kind of a miracle that's gonna occur? that's going to stop this Republican driven attempt to 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 cut back on the ability of minorities, people of color, poor people in general to get to the polls. It's a tough question, Jeff, because if you look at 2020 in the state legislators, there were 40 voting restriction bills in the less than two months in 2021. There are over 250. And, and I doubt is, whether any of them is to expand voting rights. No, they're, right? all, they're all restricted. <laughs> and the moderate Democrats and the conservative Democrats don't seem inclined to do what they could do, which is get rid of the filibuster, pack the Supreme Court, pack the Court of Appeals, and pass a strong voting rights law that uh, would protect people. They they seem to be hiding about, you know, they, I know that they have the conservative Democrats don't, they're Demo, conservative Democrats are Democrats because who knows why. They could just as well be Republicans. And, and uh, I don't see the re Democrats doing what they need to do to protect voting rights. And so, I put the I put the onus at this stage on the Democrats mm. because the Democrats could be radical and make changes that would protect the voting rights. Well, yeah, and, um, you know we can talk about it just being a a repressive moment, right? I mean that's basically what these bills are is is a, a further effort at repression. Um, that's being done to, in a way, to to make the big lie we've been living uh, come true. I, I saw a little bit of the CPAC presentation of uh, uh, pre uh, former President Trump, where he said, you know, he'd won landslides two times and he may run again to get to win a third time, and, you know, to loud applause, right? 
well, if you look at the landslide he had, since it was mainly with white people, I think he got 57% of the white vote this time. You know, it's trying to make that true in a way. Let's get rid of everybody who's not white and then we'll get the majority of the whites and life's good, you know, in that vision. It's a real sick vision of repression um, that uh, just got to keep, keep fighting, keep fighting the fight. I think, you um, know, I like thinking about it as a repressive moment, but I think it's, it's just, it goes along with the pattern of what, has always happened in this country. I think it's maybe a moment where, you know, like we just, we constantly have repressive moments. Let's put it that way. Okay, um, fair enough. We, maybe right. we just take a little breather every once in a while and then we get back, <laughs> you know, because and when it comes to voting, it, that's always been a vehicle for, um, you know, marginalizing communities. So, you know, I'd love to see a strong voting rights act and strong legislative protection, but even with it, you know, even at the sort of the strongest, if you imagine whatever you think is the strongest time of the Voting Rights Act, um, there are still so many ways to repress votes on that, you know, sort of uh, localized level that um, was happening all the time. And so I think even with, you know, whatever we want to say about sort of high level um, voting rights reform or protection, there is always going to have to be those eyes on the ground that, you um, are really, you know, working constantly to combat because repression is sort of the the name of the game. I think we just take, you know, these these brief moments of a pause, maybe, but then it gets gets right back to that. What if it's not a progress repressive moment, but a repressive movement from back before Reconstruction? Because there seems to be exactly the pattern, and it's deep, it's broad, it's vast, it's intentional. And it's yeah. inequality driven. And well, yeah, I would go so far as to say uh, up for the majority. Right. I, I would go so, I'd go so far as to say that uh, it fits a pattern just like Governor Abbott announcing that uh, Texas is going to be reopened as of next week 100%. You know, to me, I look at that as that, well, you're just going to try to get people sick and killed and, and die uh, from, from COVID. That, but you figure it's disproportionately going to hit people that don't vote for you, so that's okay with me, you know, minorities and things like that from his point of view, you know. I, I mean, that's how lethal this thing is. Uh, this, I was talking to a former mayor here down the street about it, and I said, you know, I don't understand this stuff. And he said, you know, they just don't care about people. They just don't care, you know. And I was like, yeah, it's just appalling. Um, the, other, the other big issue this week for those of us who follow free speech is the failed nomination of the budget director yeah. primarily because of her tweets. That's Which fascinating, I, fascinating to me. Bizarre world, brother. You know what I mean? After Especially given the fact that, that the tweets of Trump and all of that stuff. But as a progressive, I can't moan over her failing because she was not going to be good for progressive things. And my disappointment is that the Democrats even put her up. Mm. What does that say about the where the Democrats want to take uh, uh, Social Security and Medicare if that they would appoint someone like her, which who has such a long and strong history uh, in, in terms of thinking that these programs need to be ringed in. And so that sort of said to me, so yeah, I think the it, it's part of the thing. They, I don't know why the Republicans really went after her because I think policy-wise, she would be in their wheelhouse. So right result for the wrong reason? Well, she's going to wind up in the administration, just in yeah. a different position. No question. no question. And the other one that's apparently under attack is the uh, assistant US uh, uh, attorney general. In fact, it's so much under attack. Last night, I actually saw a commercial really? that some group has put out in support of her nomination on national television. Really? which was amazing to me. I hadn't heard that. Which assistant attorney general is under attack? Um, I, I forgot her name. Okay. Is that Clark? Um, 
the the number two, who would be the number two person in the Justice Department. Hmm. Strong civil rights background. Yes. Yes. But here was a national commercial for a sub cabinet member put right. out by some obviously very liberal organization. But that shows you how contentious that's turning out to be. Yeah. And she, uh, I, I think I got a sign up list, you know, a uh, law professors and supportive letter to sign recently in my emails about her. So, yeah, it's, uh, here we are. Here and so, Vernelia, you were telling us last time, yeah. Biden, Democrats, we got a couple minutes left. Forget this bi bipartisan stuff. That ain't yeah. going to work. Just put your team together, get your votes, not the filibuster out, do what you got to do to redistribute power, control, achieve a much better balance. How do we do that? In our last I don't know that there's anything we can do because we don't control, the, I don't control the Democrats and I don't know nobody who does control the Democrats and the Democrats are capitalists. And they are only going to do as much as necessary to keep, to be able to say to people, you know, we're unlike the Republicans. But it, I don't think they want, I don't think they, they don't, I think most of them don't want to get rid of the, uh, of the uh, 60 vote rule. My son had a good suggestion, which was don't get rid of the rule. Don't even try to get rid of the rule just make them have to really filibuster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like old schools have to stay there. Old, the old school say, okay, we're, you, we're gonna make a rule that you can only, you have to do the filibuster old school. You can't just give a notice. You have to actually stand at a stadium and talk for whatever number of hours. Uh, and and that would effectively get rid of the filibuster because so many of the people are so old. Yeah, but be careful for what you wish for. We have a Supreme Court that we have now because of what the Democrats did in getting rid of the filibuster for the Supreme Court. It was so far uh, short-sighted then. It was amazing that they did something that stupid, knowing that they would not be in power forever. And I think you know, I, I hate to disagree with you, Professor, but I think getting rid of the filibuster now, because you're in the majority, two years from now, you very likely could be in the minority again. And look what the Supreme Court has happened. We wouldn't have a 6-3 court right now if we had kept the filibuster rule. So I, I just think you can't look at today. You got to look at tomorrow. Except that tomorrow never plays out on racial issues. Well, that's a different story. And, but it you. isn't a different story. It is not a different story. It's not a different story because I have to think about what to do right now to fix as much law as possible right now, not tomorrow. Because to, and and then the, you know yeah to, you you're right, you're absolutely right that that uh, but hey maybe. If the Democrats was to get in and do a lot of stuff, they would keep the House and Senate. And, you know, note, and they wouldn't lose it in the, in a two year thing. We're looking, yeah, but you're right. I know what you're saying, and and I, but I, I, I can't moan the loss of the Senate and the because here's the deal: all the judges that all the so-called liberal judges aren't liberal in my estimation. And they never do go as far as I would like them to go. And and so, you know, porting, appointing two or three more moderate judges, okay. I mean, that maintains the status quo, but, but I, I think you're right that uh, getting rid of the filibuster was a direct relationship to being able to appoint Supreme Court judges. So we're out of time for today. That's a great place to leave off. It's not a period at the end of the sentence. It's an ellipsis. So I haven't, wait a minute. I haven't called Ben any names yet. <laughs> Hold that thought, Chuck. Is Mr. Portlock saying something there? I didn't hear him. I didn't say it. 
<laughs> you have two weeks to think of names. All right, all right. I had a bunch of names ready. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a wonderful session. Thank you so much. Come back in two weeks. Join us, folks. Be See safe. Later. Be safe. Bye, everybody. everybody, all best. Hang on for debrief. Okay.